Hello friends, Anderson here. Welcome to part 3 of our world building series for Scarlet Heroes, the upcoming campaign using Worlds Without Number. If you're new to this series, there are already two previous parts where we created the world concept and the outlying region of this fantasy megacity that we are building as a backdrop for our somewhat urban fantasy sword and sorcery campaign that I'm planning to run. So if you want to get some more context on our world of Aina and the city of coal rain in the pit, you might want to go check those out. And also while you're at it, perhaps you could subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment. I love the comments. There are so many comments. A lot of you are contributing to building this world and I'm taking some ideas and also sharing some ideas there because I do have a similar drift that I'm getting from the world building we've done so far and really what we've built so far is still fairly high level so now it's time to go a bit of a grain level deeper and have a look at the factions that are in this particular city of coal rain. Maybe a very quick recap coal rain we determined is in a pit that was created by a collapsing underground megastructure. It is a pit located in a hostile area surrounded by volcanoes, active volcanoes, cleft with canyons and in a field of ruins from a former megaplex structure, a, a enormous ruined field city that was here before coal rain was here. And coal rain itself is protected by a still active working which we determined was some sort of magical machine and I initially envisioned it as a protective bubble around the city but I think it might be more interesting and also for a city dynamic more compelling if it was more of a radiating field which gets weaker the farther out from the center you go so that we can have sort of the outskirts of the city be dangerous with monstrous incursions from the ruins and the undead or whatever stalking at night because they dare approach and the field isn't strong enough to repel them. But then of course the affluent and more connected parts of town benefit from this umbrella of unknown origin or maybe known origin but the function is currently unknown. Those are all things we still need to determine as we work out the history of the place. We also came up with some gods. The patron god of Coal Rain is Irvan, a Rakshasa demon ascended to divinity. We determined there are no planet encompassing gods anymore. Maybe they're all dead and that there is a lot of divine energy floating around and so worship creates gods, accord pacts creates gods and this Rakshasa was a, as the dice determined, placated supernatural creature that now became the patron deity of luck and crime. So it fits very well with this hodgepodge of a city. You may be wondering why the city is here in the first place as this is a very hostile area and that is where we brought in our material that dangles the carrot in front of people to come here. The field of ruins is strewn with some not yet determined magical substance or rare substance that I've kind of working titled MacGuffin Unobtainium, which it'll, it'll get a proper name at some point once we figure out more what it is. But that's the reason that you can only get this resource here in this crater surrounded pit of, of corruption and crime and, and hazardous environments and gang lords and corrupt nobles. But that's why all the nations of the world have a stake here. And that's also why the city rulership, as we will determine today what they actually are, is able to stave them off and play off the interested parties so it stays an independent city. We also created Dalraja, the Lady of Time, who used to be a human heroine, ascended to divinity and is also the goddess of war or those who fight. And we have a healer goddess that is one of the rare, still sort of world encompassing goddesses that is worshipped in different aspects in several regions of this world. And her name's Viola. Now, if we break it down to the factions now, I would like to just approach this from several different angles. One is we already have created implications of factions that need to exist. We know there are two major players in this world that are empires, 
or empire level entities. So we have one that is themed the decadent ones and one that is themed the unified ones. And for the unified ones, we also determined that they have a unifier figure that rose to prominence still within recent memory to combat the land grabbing interests of the decadent empire and unified a set of kingdoms. We found her name was Ilona and so I think that we can refer to this, also based on one of your suggestions by the way, as the Ilonate Empire or the Ilonate Coalition. This is the part where we need to get creative a little bit again and that's why I pulled up my phone and looked at the thesaurus for synonyms for coalition because Worlds Without Number does not supply us with naming tables, so we have to generate names some other way. And I was just looking up synonyms for coalition to see which one I like best. And I think we could go with the Elonate Federation or the Elonate League. I think the League sounds pretty nice because it implies some sort of even footing among the unified smaller entities. So we're gonna go with the Elonite League. That's our, well, not good guys, but the ones that are unified and standing up to the Decadent Empire. And now we also need something for the Decadent Empire. Worlds Without Numbers suggests that for names you pick sort of a linguistic theme. So we could decide on a linguistic theme for our Decadent Empire. And for that, I bring out a Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Even if you're not a huge fan of 5e, this one is pretty useful for world building in general because it has themed naming tables, both for the various origins here of the fantasy peoples, such as elf, gnome, halfling theme, tiefling theme, etc. But it also has quite a large number of tables of existing cultural touch points, just to grab some names from and have them be cohesive. So we have Egyptian, Mesoamerican, Greek, Japanese, Indian, and the more fantasy standard ones like English and French and, and what have you. I don't think we're gonna go with either of those two. I think we're gonna pick something from a road that's a bit less trodden in terms of fantasy culture creation. And I think maybe let's go with Indian as a theme in general and just determine a name as a base to generate a name for our decadent empire. I roll a percentage die and I roll a die six to determine the gender that we look in the column. So one to three is female, four to six is male in this case. Let's see what we get. We get 27 and four, that is male column Chandra. That sounds quite imposing. And I just looked it up, it apparently means bright shining and is used to refer to the moon. So that's quite an auspicious choice the dice have made for us there. Now what do we call it? Do we call it the Empire of Chandra? Let's have a look for some synonyms for empire. So I didn't like the synonyms for empire, I went on a tangent down the road for decadence, ending up with wealth, and then deciding that it's probably in the spirit of things if we call this nation the Prosperity of Chandra, and it's ruled by the opulence. That's the title of the uh, ruler of the decadent empire, or maybe the body of rulers. We haven't really decided that. That's for us to do pretty much now. And in the course of that, I also had another look at the choice of league, found it a bit boring and called it the Commonwealth, the Elonate Commonwealth instead. So we have like nicely balanced out the wealth here and the prosperity there <laughs> in a way, because you know, fantasy capitalism and stuff. <laughs> we also have a cult rolled up, a worldwide cabal that tries to take control of the secular world to basically destroy it or remake it in their dark god's image. Well, we haven't really decided whose cult this is and who they worship, but I think we're getting closer to that and maybe can decide that a bit down the line. Because if we read between the lines, this place that we rolled up and this ancient field of ruins and the fact that the gods are dead, I think this is a bit connected. Uh, my first association of this volcano encircled place was Mordor. And then I tried to figure out, okay, but then who is uh, Sauron in this case? And if 
we look at sort of the historical depictions of gods as selfish and like these, especially these powerful planets spanning gods as selfish and entitled and horrible and add a, maybe a dash of the titans from Scarland setting into this. Maybe the old pantheon, the planet spanning gods, were the horrible ones that were brought down and where a massive last stand was fought now where our city stands which caused all of these volcanoes to rise and these canyons to shatter and the mega structure to collapse and the megaplex to get wasted and turn into magically infused ruins so i think this is where our city stands and this is where the gods died the old ones and maybe the cult is a cult that wants to bring one or all of them back that's like the old priesthood spawned this cult and then it's turned into a thing that now wants to punish the rebellious sentients who couldn't take the yoke of these horrible arbitrary deities anymore and conspired with demigods and minor gods to overthrow them and succeeded. And that's also how we got Darhaja because she was one of the heroes that then ascended to godhoods after killing the gods. So that's sort of my general impression right now and I think that's sort of the filter through which I will look at the historical events now to generate a timeline as well and that also gives me some context as a touch point for this cult. All of that recap and naming done just to make sure that now we have already three factions that we need to do something with because I think it's a fairly natural assumption to say that the Prosperity of Chandra will have an embassy in the city, and so will the Elonate Commonwealth. The cult will have agents in the city, and that's maybe something we still need to determine. And that's why I want to leave the cult to be a bit amorphous, because if we roll up a entry point in one of the other factions for the cult, we can also determine that the cult is basically puppeting this faction and make it a double layer faction so i'll keep an eye out I'll, I'll handle the cult last and do pretty much everything else first and i think before we do anything else we should determine how this city is governed now the city of coal rain that we're building so let us finally go back to worlds without number and go to government construction just to show it off briefly i've created sort of a condensed version of my notes in the workbook that I made for myself here and for the open points we want to generate now the six groups of importance the six nations as the game calls them because it assumes we're creating a kingdom but we're creating this mega city so these nations are our equivalent so interest groups special important players factions etc and we also need to create the historical events and then later on zoom in more, even more, on Colrain itself. But for now we want to just understand how Colrain is governed and thereby skip a few steps down to our nation level because the government is for sure going to be a faction or it's going to be, <laughs> worse comes to worse, the puppet of the cult. So let's see how many rulers we have to begin with. That's a die four roll. That is a three. There is a group of approximate equals. Oh, that sounds lovely. So we're basically having some kind of council made up of these gluttonous local lords, maybe also parties that are being influenced by the two empires, some players that are under the sway of the cult, some guilds, some merchant houses, some criminal semi-legitimate gangs and things like that, some religious figures. Oh my god, this sounds like a mess and it sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> I've had another look at the synonym landscape and found that council somewhere in the vicinity I found assemblage, which I think is a pretty good choice for this. I guess we'll eventually call it like the assemblage it, it needs some more oomph to it but for now the assemblage will do so there is a group of approximate equals that is the ruling assemblage of Colrain 
and it's probably a mess of corruption and nepotism and favoritism and it's basically a very realistic government. I think the ruling class itself, we've already determined that it is effectively representatives of all power groups that are in the city. So basically anyone who can stake a claim to be in the assemblage is in the assemblage. And I think the reason that there's maybe not a noble line anymore is that perhaps in old history maybe there were still descendants of Daraja maybe even, those of Daraja's blood. Let's make a note of that so I as I speak I already start liking it <laughs> so I'm gonna note it down. So original rulers were of Daraja's blood at the founding of the city since everyone was pretty much an expat who settled here or representative of some other force from the outside that wanted to stake a claim at this resource area and the assemblage now that the blood of Daraja is presumed extinct governs until Daraja's inevitable return. That's sort of the carte blanche for just saying yeah we'll just keep the seat warm until the goddess returns and then hope that she never does. I think we can also focus in on this a bit more by just rolling up the source of the legitimacy and spinning this around a bit. That is a 10. They brought order out of bloody chaos. Okay, so I think what happened here is that there was some kind of interregnum period of uncertainty where maybe the last of the blood of Daraja died generations after the gods fell and then the noble houses around that all had some weak blood link to them, like third cousins or something like that all staked claim to some obscure hierarchy diagram of whose drop of blood is more important than whose and it just devolved into constant changes of rulership, instability and then the assemblage toppled them. Some rebellious nobles, some guilds, some parts of the military, some religious groups and the cult in the background and that's how the assemblage formed and well, of course, it's called the Darajan Assemblage because they're keeping Daraja's seat warm until her blood returns. That makes sense. Or until somebody rises that can lay claim to Daraja's blood. Maybe there's like a messianic storyline as well that is being preached by the clergy of Daraja. That sounds good. Let's have a look at the servants of the ruling order. How do the rulers exert their will on the people? So there's a bunch of options how we can envision this government mostly operating. Of course, they'll probably do a little bit of all of this. But what is their primary tool of control? Four, a major religion allied with state power. <laughs> that works really well. So we can assume that the priesthood of Daraja also has maybe a stabilizing influence because it sure as hell isn't going to be Ilvan, which sheds a bit of a light also maybe on the goddess herself. We already determined she's probably not a nice goddess. She is very much into those who fight, those who help themselves. And so maybe she doesn't particularly intervene when her priesthood now becomes sort of enforcers and bootlickers for the government here and also has a seat in that government probably. So now I'm, I'm picturing like Darajan enforcers, temple guards as the main feared authority that maybe doesn't regularly patrol the streets but you see them around, you see their sequestered temple somewhere in that pit and you know that if, if there is a rebellion those temple gates will open and the cloistered warriors will ride out and crush everything. So the most feared servants of the ruling order are the temple guards of the Raja. We've already answered the rulership question, but the disease of rule, so what is currently plaguing this government, that we could roll. That's another die 12. Three, a grand scheme has gone horribly wrong. We'll make a note of that for when we tackle the problems and goals of the nation somewhat further down the line. And maybe we can give ourselves the one roll government details just as some further ammunition on this particular first faction that we're determining. 
So let us once more take all of the dice and roll them. I'm about to make a huge mistake in interpreting these die rolls, specifically when it comes to the d4 roll, because I'm looking at the d6 table. Stay tuned, it'll all work out fine in the end. All right, let's have a look, shall we? The d4 gives us a two. That is how established is the current ruler. They're newly ascended to the throne. Now, what does that mean in light of our recent discovery that this is a group of approximate equals? And I think the approximate is the operative world. It will have a figurehead. I'm particularly thinking of this in terms of the Venetian system with a doji. Not the crypto one, the one with the actual gold coins in the 1100s. And that was an elected official and one who was mostly a figurehead, but also somebody who had actual power. But it was a very clear designation of what the doge was allowed to do and wasn't allowed to do as far as I know. So maybe we do have a figurehead of the government who also has some power and that is one who recently ascended. So the assemblage leader recently changed. And if we need a title for this office, I think looking at a few synonyms for stand-ins, for representatives, if this is really an extension of, well, I'll just keep this seat until the Darajan blood comes back to power, we'll call him the surrogate. So the Darajan assemblage is ruled by the surrogate, who is also the nominal ruler of Colrain. That's interesting. I would have actually thought that Irvan would be more the main influence on the government, but it, second thought doesn't really fit. He seems to be more like, not quite the mascot, but more like the spirit of the city, the rotten part, the not so directly in the light part. And he probably doesn't care about direct rule as long as he has sway over the hearts and minds of the common folk and also can direct the rulers through their vices. So he's working, his workings are indirect. Ugh, I am a fool. I have consulted the wrong table for the d4, but that's okay. <laughs> so now we also know that the government is not very stable. It has significant problems but it functions, that actually makes sense. And now the actual Die 6 result would have been they have a hardcore of useful supporters for how established is the current ruler. And I think that can be combined. So we will say that the leader has recently changed. There is a new surrogate with a hardcore of supporters, but a currently unstable rule. Maybe they're perceived as weak, maybe they don't have the backing of everybody. They have the hardcore supporters, some of whom are strong, but they also have strong opponent factions. And so the government is unstable. Okay, let me now make extra clear that I read the next results correctly. What problems do their ministers have? They are committed to a very bad idea. <laughs> I think this is where we can crack out the Tome of Adventure design because we have a villain's plan section with a master table of villain's plans. Let's see what this bad idea is. Let me just safeguard our die results first so I don't make the same mistake that I made last time. And let's roll a percentage dice. We get a 98. Support evil groups secretly. <laughs> that is a bad idea. Which evil group? <laughs> I like that one of the results is wealthy people. <laughs> 46. Descendants of those who attended a particular unholy event in the forgotten or even ancient past. Is that our cult? Is that our inn for our cabal or is this something else? Is this maybe the cult of Irugu that we came up with last time? That's hanging out in volcanoes? Let's leave it open for now. We just know that the high minister, so the assemblage as a whole, I would read this as because they all then also have different tasks in government, support an evil group secretly because they're committed to a very bad idea. And the group they're supporting are descendants of those who attended a 
unholy event in the ancient past, and this has something to do maybe with the fallen gods or with the recently risen Irugu or something like this. Well, we'll find this out eventually, I think. For now, it's good enough for literally government work. So already 10 was a 5. That is a strength of the government. The populace is convinced it will bring good. That's probably the priest's fault. Yeah, I can sort of see that where the government is being praised in sermons and their righteousness is being pointed out and the sacrifices they make or whatever. So that works. We have a three on our D12 for officials recently causing problems. Bribe hungry and meddling magistrates. That's also very on brand. I mean, I had a hunch already that this city would be running on bribery and corruption, but now we have confirmation. And lastly, a four on our die 20, a high noble made rebellious noises. That's probably the faction leader of the current surrogates, recently elected surrogates opponent. So the hardcore opposition is being led by this high noble. So we know that the opponent is a high noble, maybe the current surrogate is not a noble. That could be the point of contention as well. So new surrogate of non-noble stock and the opposition rallies around a high noble who is not on board with this and is making rebellious initiatives trying to form a consensus in the assemblage, in the Darajan assemblage, to depose the new surrogate who then probably has the backing of the guilds and the merchants and things like that. So that's our government. That's one of our factions. I'll mark that on the group sheet that the Darajan assemblage is group number one. This is taking a lot longer than I thought. Let's make one more, at least, maybe two more. And then I'm afraid I have to split this in two probably because it's already going on for a while. One of the things I definitely want to do also is to then eventually reflect these factions with stats and the faction turn, but that's a lot of administrative overhead. I may record this, I'm not sure yet, but I'll definitely do it. For now, let's focus on generating the lore and the factions themselves. So we've got a government, what else do we need? I guess maybe we need some strong crime group or something, what do we have? Yeah, I think we'll use the criminal courts set of tables. A court in the sense of worlds without number is just a group sharing a common goal. So a criminal court is a conglomerate of villainous outlaws and we can give them a flavor, we can give them a certain face as well in terms of people and we can give them some conflicts as well. So let's call them the criminal faction as a working title and find out what their primary mode of crime is now. Five, black marketeer. That makes a lot of sense considering that maybe this resource is regulated somehow. So this this MacGuffin unobtainium that we're finding in the ruins is not just freely sold. The government has its hands on it. The prospectors that go out there, the adventurers, they have to sort of deal with an official guild that then gives them a fixed rate for this resource that they find, which is still a good way to get rich. But there is a better way to get richer. Well, if it's a better way, I'm not sure, but there is a way to get richer and that is to sell it on the black market. And especially with a city that is rife with corruption and thievery and all the surroundings here, plus the black market generated with this magical resource. I think the black marketeers are a very, very strong, semi-legitimate merchant business. So I'm, I'm assuming they have a representation in the assemblage indirectly, maybe through a shady merchant house and the official guild that, that is administrating our magical resource they don't like each other very much. So they're black marketeers that deal mostly in the in the guild-regulated magical unobtainium. Who is the major figure in this black market organization? 
Eight, a wicked noble patron. Okay, so they exist partly due to the patronage of a wicked noble. What's the source of the power of the noble? Well, I assume the patronage itself is, is helpful, but maybe we can flesh them out a little bit. Nine, they're personally terrifying and capable of murder. Okay, so we have a, an interesting person on our hands. Very ruthless. Now I wanna know who this is. Let's get a name. Actually, to pick a name, let's first determine an origin. And that's where I run into a problem and might need your help. If you know of any random table, any book that contains such tables, that is a list of all sorts of fantasy origins, descends, peoples like dwarves, elves, ogres, orcs, tieflings, can be anything from bog standard fantasy folk over frog people, avians, just if there's anything you know of, any book that has this, because I don't think the five ebooks even really have this, at least I haven't found it, feel free to let me know because I need something like this for this metropolis that we're building here. For now, I'm just gonna help myself by quickly jumping online, printing out a resource from Dice Geeks, which gives us at least a spectrum to work with. So let's first determine what kind of a terrifying, murderous, wicked noble patron we're dealing with here. I mean, that makes all sorts of sense. <laughs> 99, it's a tiefling. Do I smell a prosperity of Chandra connection here? I think so. We also know that there is like a gang out there somewhere that fleeces incoming adventurers and steals stuff from them. So maybe our tiefling here, if they can't get a hold of it through the black market and have to pay for it, they're gonna have to just take it from them. So maybe our tiefling here also has a stake in that, but getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So now we need a tiefling name. And by the way, I'm just going by generic nomenclature tiefling right now. So we're talking demon blooded fell sentients who can be good, who can be evil, who lean towards quote unquote evil alignments and who form in my view right now, a very central part of the prosperity of Chandra, but they're not the exclusive only clique there, so I'm picturing tieflings and all sorts of other dark elves and deep gnomes and dwarves of suspect nature and dragonborn and whatever, you, what have you. And so our name, that is a three which puts it in the female column and a 36 which gives us Jezebeth. Okay, so that is the power behind the black marketeers, the not really leader, but the the one by whose grace the leader exists. What is their current concern? Their internal conflict is what? A three, someone stolen court property for their own use. So court in the sense of this as a an entity. I would take this with a bunch of black marketeers as someone is taking, skimming off the top, embezzling. So there is some unrest because funds are disappearing and not everyone gets their fair share. Well, fair. External conflicts, let's have a look there too. Eight, they've acquired something that's causing them dire woe. Okay, woe indeed. So like, uh, do we need to flesh that out now? No, I don't think so. We just know that the black marketeers have purchased something out of the ruins maybe and now they can't get rid of it because it's cursed or so could be a cursed item, could be something else. I'm just noting it as a dire woe due to a recent acquisition, a cursed item question mark. I think that's good enough for our criminals. We'll let it percolate a bit before we give it a name. Maybe you have a naming suggestion, so feel free to fire away. Let's maybe shed some light on the merchant angle and roll up a business faction. Because I think there are a lot of ways for a merchant to be powerful in this city. Could also be the guilds that we have as a counterpoint now to the criminals, the strong guild that, that buys up all the magical resource and, and allocates it. That's probably more like a government office, actually. It's probably government regulated. So that guild is an extension of the government. We'll see what, what theme we get or what vibe we get from what we're rolling. 
because I don't think all of this fits equally to everything else. So let's, let's have a relation with their market role to place them. That is a four. The market is resentful, they deal harshly and graspingly. I think that makes them the guild of magical resource because that's fertile ground for the black marketeers. They're, they're gouging price because they know the adventurers are only allowed to sell to them and they harshly punish anyone who doesn't. So those people that go out in the ruins bring back their stuff and they get not the best value for their efforts. And the harshness and the black market existence also implies to me that as they're a price gouging, harsh and grasping group, they also employ enforcers and investigators to figure out who's selling to the black marketeers and to root them out. So it's like they have their own private police, sort of. What major figure can we roll up? Six, the head accountant. How exciting! But that actually might make sense, because that's the money person. That's the one who's getting cursed for setting the new rates for the purchasing that the adventurers and ruin explorers then have to abide by. So while they may not know who runs the guild, they know who fixes the prices and they hate them, I say him, them with a passion. Let's see who they are. Let me bring out the origins table again. 46, that's a halfling. <laughs> a lightfoot halfling. I don't think we need to make that distinction. I think that's more of a D&D &D thing, but I do want to have this multitude of multiverse folk hanging out in cold rain, so a uh, halfling is more than welcome. Let us figure out what they are in terms of their name and gender understanding. That is a male 94 will be. And we even have family names here, so let's rock out a family name. Reed Fellow. Wonder whether they've seen a Reed in their entire life, but okay. Welby is a Reed Fellow and a price gouging son of a bitch. So <laughs> let's um, check the internal problems. The deed to some vital property has been lost. I am drawing a complete blank on that one. But maybe it'll come to us through some other development around us and we can move on to the external one. Bandits or paid thieves have plundered something. Eleven. I will take that to mean that our well-organized funded pit bandits that exist on the fringes of Colrain are so bold that they even attack the official convoys and storehouses of the guild, or at least they, they try to. They're probably very well secured, but they have found some success and the guild is currently in uproar. I think that works. So we've created the assemblage as the government, we've created the criminal faction, we've created the business faction, and we know of three other groups that have a stake in here, namely the two Empire players and the Cabal. And we'll continue developing all of that next time. So thanks very much for watching. I look forward to your ideas and your input in the comments. I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.